Good morning, Rebuild Fellowship. This is the day that the Lord has made, and I choose to rejoice and be glad in it. Hello, my name is Melissa Oliver, and thank you so much for allowing me to worship with you again this week. This is my husband, Will, which I know you all know. This is also our son, Ethan. And we're here today to give God glory, honor, and praise for all that he has done, for who he is, and what he's getting ready to do in our lives. Hallelujah. God, we say thank you. We say thank you. We say thank you. We say thank you, God. You are amazing at all that you do, God. And we thank you for what you're getting ready to do in our lives, God. We thank you for the healing that you will place over the land, God. Hallelujah. We thank you for our hearts that will turn towards you, God. And we say thank you for all things, God, for you do all things well. And we bless you today and every day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Our God is greater. Our God is stronger. Lord, you are higher than any other. I know him to be a healer, and he's awesome in power. He's our God. Hallelujah. Water, you turned into wine. Open the eyes of the blind There's no one like you None like you Into the darkness you shine Out of the ashes we rise There's no one like you Thank you. 
Our God is stronger. Lord, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power. Our God, he is our God. Yeah. Our God is greater. Our God is stronger. Lord, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power. He's our
Well, good morning, Rebuild family and friends. How are we doing this morning? Okay, I can't even see you where you are, but I know that was a bit dry. So let's try that again. Good morning, Rebuild family and friends. How are we doing this morning? That's a little bit better, and I'm hoping you gave a little bit better. So, so glad to be with you all again this morning. Uh, for those of you that are tuning in for the first time here uh, with us at Rebuild, I just want to say thank you. Thank you for hanging out with us this morning. As always, uh, we at Rebuild believe that uh, our church is not just uh, not just a church. It's actually a place where your life and God's love meet. And so hopefully as you uh, sit with us uh, with our service today, you have experienced that. And I hope that continues uh, for you today um, because love is not just our mission. It is also our identity. And so we uh, like to have love moments where we extend hugs. And so where you are, I believe you can hug whoever you're with in the space that you're with. And so this is a practicing hug of social distance. So there you go. Love you. Miss y'all. Thank y'all so much uh, for being a part. And so we're going to get right into it. Uh, today, we are starting in a new series called Victory in the Valley. Victory in the Valley. Uh, this was birthed out of a uh, message I preached on last week, Psalm 23. And I just think in light of everything that's going on, it's important for us to hear from God's word, uh, to be encouraged, to be strengthened, uh, and to begin to have some sense of understanding of not only what is happening in our season, but most importantly, uh, what is God doing? How is he leading? How is he guiding? And how is he speaking? And one of the ways that we're able to kind of uh, understand it a little bit better is kind of get into his word, not kind of to get into his word and to hear his voice uh, through his holy word. And beautiful thing about the Psalms is Psalms speaks to pretty much every emotion that a human being can face and particularly those that have walked with the Lord. Uh, and so this is a beautiful place for us in this particular season to get a better understanding of our emotions and how to process them rightly. And then how does God uh, help to lead and guide us and comfort us in seasons like this? And so uh, with that being said, would you go to Psalm 46? Uh, if you still a bit old school like me and you got your your tree Bibles, or if you're one of the cool kids and you got your electronic Bible, uh, would you either turn or would you click and scroll to Psalm 46, Psalm 46? And as you're going there, if you're like me and uh, you love to play outside as a kid, you probably played a whole host of games outside. But one that stands out is in probably in the top three of games you played as a child. It's hide and seek, hide and seek. And there's different variations of the game. But the way I used to play it was somebody would be the it person. So they would be at whatever home base was, whatever that was the porch or it was a tree or somebody's car. They would sit there and be it. They would count to most likely 10. And most po most people would probably cheat counting. I'm thinking people like my sister Yolanda Finney, who would probably cheat when counting. She'd probably go one, two, three, four, ten, 10. And she'd probably run out and chase somebody like that. Uh, but they would count to a certain number, whatever that number was. As they were counting, they would hide their face. And the other kids would go hide. And the objective was, was to not get caught, to not get caught. And so as the person went to look for somebody to make them the it person, the one who ha would have to go and look for others, uh, they would have to hurry up and get to home base, whatever home base was for safety. And figuratively for us today, it seems like we're in a modern day hide and seek life scenario. We're actually literally hiding out in our homes while it seems like the coronavirus is trying to tag us to be it. So we're taking shelter in our homes and we're seeking wisdom. We're seeking understanding of what's going on in our day and time and what's happening out here. The virus that we're facing, none of us want to be tagged by it. And so today I'm hoping in light of everything, how our minds have been wrestling in this season and how we have sought for answers and understanding. I'm hoping today through God's word in Psalm 46 that we'll have a better understanding of how we can uh, take the next step in this season. And so I don't want to I don't want to sit here and act like I'm the subject matter expert on crisis. That's I, I'm not that. But I do know based on my relationship with the Lord Jesus and all he has taught me almost over the last 20 years of walking with him, I can point you to him 
And I know he is, as scripture says, he's the only wise eternal king. And so he's able to help give us a proper perspective on how we are to live in this particular day and age. And so with that being said, uh, the name of my message today is rooted right in Psalm 46. And I'll give you that in just a moment. But Psalm 46, let's read together. If you have your Bibles and you're ready. Uh, I'll be reading from the English Standard Version and it reads, <clears throat> excuse me, God is our refuge and strength very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea. Verse three, though its waters roar and foam, <clears throat> though the mountains, excuse me, though the mountains tremble at its swelling, Selah. Verse four, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the most high. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. I love the way some translations say God will help her at the break of morning when morning breaks. Verse six, the nations rage, the kings totter. He utters his voice, the earth melts. Verse seven, the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress or refuge, Selah. Verse eight, come behold the works of the Lord. How has how he has brought desolations on the earth? Verse nine, he makes war cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Verse 10, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Verse 11, the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress or refuge, Selah. Would you pray with me? Father, if there was ever a time in our world where we needed you to speak, to speak audibly, to speak in a way that we can truly hear, God, it is now. And God, I just want to be an instrument that you can use today the communi to communicate that you are with us as this psalm declares. And God, I thank you that out of this, it will bring forth, as Philippians tells us, the peace of God that surpasses all understanding to guard the hearts and minds of your people through Christ Jesus, now and forevermore. God, I love you. I thank you. And we need you. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. The title of my message, family, if anything, is rooted right in verse one. God is our refuge and strength. The name of this message uh, for you to understand a bit better how to have victory in the valley, how his presence helps us in perilous times is to know what verse one says. God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. Now, let me help you out with something. I want you to understand the defi definition of refuge before we go on. It means shelter or protection from danger or distress. It is shelter or protection from danger or distress. Listen, God is declaring, the psalmist is declaring about God, and God is emphasizing through the psalmist to say, I'm your shelter, I'm your protection from danger, and I'm your protection from distress. Verse one says, God is our refuge and strength and ever present help in our time of trouble. I have four observations, four takeaways that I hope you'll get from this. We're just going to walk through the text. We're going to walk through these 11 verses. And I want to show you these four observations or takeaways that I hope will help to give you some perspective that will encourage you and that you can draw strength from. And the first thing that we want to see is the psalmist, his faith confession. Back in verse one again, God is our refuge and strength. I can't re-emphasize or restate that or repeat that verse enough. God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. The psalmist starts off with making a faith confession. And a confession is this, it's simply this, a formal statement of religious beliefs, that's one definition found in Webster's, or another definition comes from a legal perspective that says an acknowledgement of a fact or an allegation as true or proven. 
Let me give you that again because I want this to make sure that it sits in you, that you can digest it properly. It says one, there's one definition from Webster that says it is a formal statement of religious beliefs. Or there's a legal definition that Webster's also provides and it says it is acknowledgement of a fact or an allegation as, as true or proven. Well, let me bring this home a little bit more. Listen, family, we have the Bible which is 66 books of a formal statement of our religious beliefs. And we, the believers, the disciples, the saints of God, we gave our acknowledgement of this fact by way of our faith confession when we declared that we were sinners in need of the saving grace of Jesus Christ. When we made that acknowledgement, that we couldn't do life on our own terms, that we couldn't do life in our own strength, that we can we could not do life our own way, and we realized that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. We acknowledged and we surrendered, and that is the confession. That is what we now walk in. That is the faith confession that we have, and it has become for us an acknowledgement of a fact. Why is this so important? Why am I staying here a bit? Because as disciples of Jesus Christ, when Christ saved us and set us free, he not only gave us a new nature, but listen, he gave us a new language. He didn't just give us a new mind, family. He gave us a new mouth. He didn't just give us a new head. He gave us a new heart. Listen to what 2 Corinthians chapter 5, if you don't believe me, let me bring this in as supporting evidence. Uh, since we had a legal definition for this, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, starting in verse 17, says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Verse 18 says, All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. We have received the good news as we say as we say a rebuild, and now we're responding by it because he has now given us the ministry, ministry of reconciliation. And then verse 19 says, that is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. And that part says, now it's time for us to go reproduce it in the life of somebody else. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. Did you hear that? We're not supposed to go respond by reproducing, since we have received it, reproducing the good news in the life of others in, this, in our community and in our world because Christ has made us ambassadors for Christ when he saved us. And so as ambassadors, we speak the language under the authority of the kingdom we represent. We know anything about ambassadors, uh, ambassadors to different nations, you know, when they go to different countries, they speak on the behalf of the kingdom and the authority that has been given to them. And so we are ambassadors of the kingdom of Jesus Christ. We are ambassadors of the kingdom of heaven, and we have a different language. We operate under a different authority, and it's important for us to represent that language, represent that authority here in the earth. That's why you keep hearing pastors say, we choose faith over fear. And that's why you hear medical professionals say, this is what you need to do. Wash your hands. You need to practice social distancing and all of the other things that they have communicated. They're speaking on the authority of the medical community. And in like manner, we need to speak on the authority of the kingdom of heaven in this season. And we need to choose faith over fear. And the way we learn how to speak this language of the kingdom is we got to get in our word, y'all. If there's ever been a time where it is extremely needed is now. And we can look back all over human history and say this is not just one important time in human history that we need the word of God. We need it every single waking moment of our lives. We need it every single sleeping moment of our lives. We need to be ambassadors for Christ here in the earth and tell people that God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in time of trouble. And that leads me to verse two. So out of that, verse two starts off, the A part of the verse says this, therefore, we will not fear. Do you hear that? Therefore, we will not hear. Because God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble, we will not fear. 
Now, that's interesting because the verse starts off saying, therefore, and if you grew up in the, the Baptist faith, you grew up in the Baptist tradition, you would have learned that uh, whenever you see a therefore in the Bible, you have to go back and understand and look to see what it is there for. Because of what verse one says, verse two now holds true. The the declaration of verse one leads to the confidence, if you will, of verse two. Therefore, we will not fear. From our time in Psalm 23 last week, King David starts off by saying, the Lord is my shepherd and I shall not want. You hear this similar writing, if you will, this similar phrasing uh, between this psalmist and King David. King David says, the Lord is my shepherd and I shall not want. This particular psalmist says, he says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. And therefore, I will not fear. We will not fear. He makes this corporate. He wants you to know that as a body, a household of faith, we're not going to fear about this. And in like manner, we see that he uses the same kingdom language because he is serving the same king. He has access to the same truth and the same promises that King David was afforded. And so he rests in that. And that's why he can say, we, we will not fear. He has experienced the same presence and the same power of God. And he it can emphatically say, because God is my refuge and strength, my very present help in trouble, we will not fear. Family, I can't stress that enough to you. We will not fear. Because we are, like Hebrews chapter 10 says, we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but we are those who have faith and preserve their souls. How do we preserve our souls? One, we remember the good news of Jesus Christ, that Jesus did everything necessary to save us, that he stood in our place and he paid our sin debt. And then out of that, we remember that all of the promises in Christ Jesus are yes and amen according to scripture. And so we preserve our souls by reading and remembering and reciting the holy scriptures and saying that God it's in your word and I believe you because you're not a man that you should lie nor are you the son of man that should repent and your word declares that you watch over your word so it would do exactly what you have commissioned it to do that is the kind of God we serve and that's why we can say God is our refuge and strength a very present help in our time of trouble so my brothers and sisters I want to let you know that he paints a picture for you to understand that even more even more going into verse two and three as it builds a little bit that even in the darkest, bleakest moments of life, fear should not be an option for the saints. It, it, it doesn't say, listen, it doesn't mean that fear won't try to rise, won't try to enter in, it won't try to consume you. But what, what we're not going to do, we're not going to reside in that place. We're not going to take on that nature because if any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away and the new has come. And so he goes on to finish off verse two and he says, therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way. And the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. If you've ever been to a beach and there's kind of a mountain there, you see like when the waters are raging at a particular time, if a storm is coming through, it's just bouncing hard up against the mountainous regions. And it seems like it is causing mass destruction. And I know it is because it's causing erosion and other stuff that scientists have let us know here in the earth. And so even if that is happening, even if the earth itself starts troubling us by way of storms, tsunamis, hurricanes, tornadoes, by way of earthquakes and the like, we will not fear. Because verse one has already emphatically declared and positioned us in him that he is our refuge. Again, this is important to note because my God, your God, our God is the creator of the heavens and the earth. According to what we read in the very beginning of the book in Genesis chapter one, verse one, it says that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. David goes on to remind us in Psalm 24 when he says, the earth is Lord, the fullness thereof, and they that dwell therein. He has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. And so the imagery used here by the psalmist is very important for us to pay attention to because he has already stated and declared that God is the creator in the heavens of the earth. So if the earth starts acting up, I don't have to worry because God is the creator of it. 
So if my, my phone starts acting up or if there's any electronic device or other piece of equipment that starts acting up, I just simply go to the manual to troubleshoot to figure out what's going on. And so then he uses this, this imagery to draw us deeper into this understanding. He says, listen, though the earth gives way, I don't worry because God created the heavens and earth. Then he says, mountains fall into the heart of the seas. And he says, uh, I ain't going to chip off that because I know in my God, God has given me faith to move mountains. You hear what I'm saying? Listen, mountains fall into the heart of the seas, but I ain't even tripping off what mountains doing. I'm not even tripping. I'm not even taking stock in that because I know God has given me in Christ Jesus faith, the ability to use my faith to move mountains. How do I know this to be true? Well, let me bring in Mark chapter 11, verse 23. I'm actually going to start in verse 22 and it says, and Jesus answered them, have faith in God. Verse 23, truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea and did listen and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. Now, listen, I've been told you, I've been walking with God almost 20 years and me personally, I've never spoken to a mountain and seen it move, but there have been mountains in my life that I have spoken to according to what God has promised me in his holy word. And that mountain, that mountain has been moved. There have been mountains in uh, my relationships. There have been mountains in my finances. There was been mountains on the job. There were mountains when I was in school and I just began to lean into the promises of God. One promise that says in Psalm 34, it says, uh, verse 19, he says, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him from them all. I can use that one verse to tell you that any mountain that came up. I grabbed a hold of that one verse and I spoke it in faith. It was it was it was one powerful verse that seemed very little, but it had a lot of power. And I began to speak it, and those mountains began to move. Then he says, Though its waters roar and foam, and the mountains quake with their surging. Listen, I don't even tripping off the waters. I don't even trip off the waters acting up because Christ told me he is the living water. Again, since y'all don't believe me, let me bring a little scripture in on this. John chapter 7, verse 38 says this, whoever believes in me as the scriptures, I told y'all this word is important, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living waters. Listen, family, we're supposed to be, uh, as believers, all of us collectively, uh, once we band together, we should be like a mighty ocean. All of these uh, uh, hearts that are filled with the living waters of God should be flowing out in our communities when we're, when we're in the workplace, when we're in the home place, when we're, when we're having time with our family and, and our children and other family members, when we're, when we're spending time, maybe we're talking with our neighbors, when we're, when we're in the workplace and we're doing our job with our supervisors, our managers and other co-workers, when we're at the doctor's office, when we're at the grocery store, wherever it is, out of us should be flowing rivers of living water because family, the reality is, there's a lot of people that can't say this. There's a lot of people whose hearts are dammed up and there's no living water flowing through them. And so it is imperative for us to grab a hold of verse one and say, God is my refuge and strength, a very present help in time of trouble because somebody needs that strength. Somebody needs that courage. Uh, somebody needs that confidence, and especially in days like this. So he, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, he's the, the same God who was able to part the Red Sea. And he was the same God when the children of Israel in wilderness and walking through the desert, he was able to use Moses to bring water out of the rock. And he's the same God that while his disciples were traveling from one shore to the next shore and the, 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 the storm came through and the wind and the waves were trying to overtake them and bring them to a point where they thought they were going to drown and die. He was the same one who could speak to those waters and say be still and the disciples were able to get over to the shore and then back again on dry ground and so surely my brothers and sisters if he dealt with water issues back then he can sure deal with water issues right now water issues are never a problem for our God and so out of that I have to resolve myself like the psalmist where I know that God is my refuge and strength and very present help in time of trouble I resolve myself to not fear to not worry because when uh, earthly waters try to cut up I remember that I'm filled with eternal waters 
Let me say that again. I don't have to fear or worry about earthly waters because I'm filled with eternal waters. And so if you continue to hear encouragement from a man or woman of faith in this season, uh, please know it's just not empty rhetoric that they're just saying because they're a pastor or they're a fellow believer. It's not just lip service. My brothers and sisters, it is life service. It is uh, uh, words that have been fulfilled. It is words that are faith filled and they are words of life that come from the author of life. It's not just empty rhetoric that they're speaking and it's not just something uh, churchy or cliche-ish to say right now in a season like this. If you receive it in the spirit in which is given, it's supposed to give you life and life more abundantly in Christ Jesus, which leads us to the next part of the text, Selah. The songwriter, the psalmist puts a pause, puts a break in here because he wants us to reflect on what was just released in those first three verses. Selah. You can take a Selah moment like this and grab your water. This is a classic Joe Sink pottery mug. Thank you, my brother. Miss you, man. Love you, bro. He wants you to get refreshed. He wants you to take a pause. He wants you to uh, rehear. He wants you to reprocess what was just released, what was just spoken. And one can make the argument, my brothers and sisters, my brothers and sisters, that we are in a sila season. Everything seems to be put on pause right now. And we are having to reflect on what has happened or is still happening in the world today. And so let me let me just take this moment. Let me have a sila moment with you. Let's let's can y'all be like my, my therapist in the morning in, in this moment. Can y'all help me out right now? Let me take a moment to have a personal moment of reflection with you. Uh, I'm confident for me. Listen, family, I can only speak for me. I'm confident that one of the things that the Lord Jesus is doing, again, I've shared this before. I love what uh, Dr. John Piper says. He said, at any given point in time, God is doing about 10,000 things, but you're only aware of about three of them. And so one of the things, one of those three that I'm aware of that God is doing in my own personal life, I'm getting, again, again, I'm just speaking about me. I'm speaking for me. And what I'm saying is I'm realizing that God is dealing with idols in my life. What are idols? Anything that we exalt and esteem over Jesus. I love what one pastor says, when a good thing becomes a God thing. And so I, I, I'm realizing that I have idols in my life that I need to deal with and I need to release and surrender uh, to the to the to the feet of Jesus. I need to release them and give them over. And I'm again I'm only speaking about me. I don't know what he's doing in your life. I can only speak for me right now. So I'm having a Selah or be still moment. I am examining myself to see what things I have trusted in or I have prioritized over him. And fortunately for me, family, because of listen, because of his grace, not by any work, because of his grace and his mercy. This exam that I'm taking is actually open book. But that, listen, that doesn't make this exam any easier because if you were in classes like I was in growing up in school, open book was the hardest exam to take. And I would rather take an exam where I maybe didn't study that well without using my book than to take that because I felt like I stood a better chance of getting a better grade. But again, his grace is sufficient and he is really the good teacher Watch this, because he's already passed the test for me. That's even, that's even better for my soul right now. I can do, because why? Because Hebrews chapter 4 says this. He says, we have not a high priest who's not able to sympathize with our weaknesses. Listen, he was tempted in every way, yet without sin. There he is. He passed the test. He was the student in the classroom that took the test. He was tempted in every way, yet without sin. Therefore, I can boldly come to the throne of grace, obtain mercy, and find grace to help me in my time of need. Family, that is important. That is important. He passed the test for me, and in his holy word, he's given me the answers for me to be more successful, not only in this test, but any test that may come my way to have a, a measure of success as I walk this walk with him. And that success is not what we make it out to be. My, the success is my soul prospering. He said in his word, beloved, above all things, I wish that you may prosper as your soul prospers. 
That's what real success is. That my soul is prospering in Jesus name. Listen, it is rooted in Jesus, not in my my finances, not in my social network, not in my family bloodline or heritage. My success is not rooted in my 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 resume or my CV. It's not it's not in any of those things. It's not in the number of children I have. It's not in the neighborhood that I reside in. It's not in the tax bracket that I'm in. The success that I have is that my soul is prospering for the name and fame of Jesus Christ. And so with that being said, break over. Now let's get back to our regularly scheduled program in verses four through seven. Listen, verse four reads this. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God. Listen how beautiful it is. The holy place where the most high dwells. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at break of day. We will not fear. Listen, and we will not fall. Nations, verse six, are in uproar. Kingdoms fall. Have you ever seen a time, family, where this not where this is true? Nations are in uproar right now. Kingdoms are falling, and God lifts His voice, and the earth melts. Here's the second observation I want to see. I want us to see this contrast. The first thing we see is this faith confession by the psalmist, but then I want us to see this contrast that he writes in between verses one through three and verses uh, four through six. Uh, we see this contrast because in more so verses two and three, we see that the earth is shaking. The earth is cutting up. The earth is literally shaking. But in these verses, the eternal one is being still. Nature is roaring. Nature, nature is raging, but the name of our God is still reigning. God not only serves as our refuge in times like this, but he becomes a responder for us too. And he responds, listen, he responds in three ways. The first way is in verse four, he dwells with us. Verse four said, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the most high dwells. He dwells with us because Christ has torn the veil by what he did for us on Calvary's cross. Revelation tells us now he dwells with mankind. Now he comes to be with his people. And once we were not a people, but now we have become a people. Once we had not obtained mercy, now we have obtained and received mercy because he dwells and because he dwells with us. It is in Christ that we live and we move and we have our being. The second way he responds is this. In verse five, God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at break of day. Listen, what does he do now? How does another way he responds? He responds by dwelling with us, but he also helps us. And then he puts a very specific time in this. He says he helps us at break of day. Listen, family, where do we where have we heard this before? Well, we've heard it here before where it says weeping may endure for a night. Come on, give me a church right now. Somebody should have took a lap in your living room, should have jumped up off your couch right now. You've heard this before. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Hallelujah. Praise our God. Joy comes in the morning. We might be in a night season, but the Lord said in Psalm 46, he helps us at the break of day. And when he helps us at the break of day, what he's saying is, I got joy. So whatever pain, whatever sorrow we might be experiencing right now, like the Apostle Paul said, is it a light and momentary affliction? And I reckon that the sufferings of this present time cannot be compared to the glory that will be revealed to us by Christ Jesus. Joy comes in the morning, family. Be encouraged. Clap your hands. Stomp your feet. Celebrate the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He says that he comes to help. Verse six says this, nations are in uproar, kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice, the earth melts. Verse six, listen, he dwells with us, he helps us, but then he speaks. Oh my goodness, if you could, if you could pick me up in the spirit right now, if you could pick me up, listen, he speaks y'all, he dwells, he helps, and he speaks. We know that uh, 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 we know that man cannot live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Like we can't just live by bread that we get from the grocery store. We can't live by our favorite uh, 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 sauces and our favorite meats and our favorite cheeses and vegetables and things of that nature. That's good. We need that physically, but more so than that, 
We need the spiritual nourishment for our souls. So we can't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. I love what I love what they say in Exodus. The children of Israel say that uh, Moses, after he spent time with God, he came down and he said, listen, uh, Moses is good. It's good that we hear your voice because, yes, we hear we we hear we get that. We hear your voice. We understand. But when God speaks, we have life. I'm paraphrasing the verse. He said, Moses is good when we hear you. But when God speaks, we have life. So, God, I just want to ask you in this moment, continue speaking. Family, continue to open up your spiritual ears to hear what the spirit of the Lord wants to say to you right now. What is God desiring to say to you? Will you just see law yourself? Will you just let the Lord have a moment with you? Will you take a break from all that's swirling around you and going on around you? And would you just allow yourself to allow God to speak to you? Would you give yourself that blessing? Would you give yourself that type of moment? So moreover, family, the psalmist builds on his confession. It aids him to see the contrast between, listen, what the world speaks and what the word has spoken. He see the world speaking uh, by the by the mountains crashing and the waters roaring and raging. That's what the world is speaking. And we can see that in our day, you know, so much is happening in our financial systems and so much happening in our government right now. So much happening in our health systems and all of these type of things. And, and the mountains are crashing and the seas are roaring in that way. And some seasons you're feeling like that when stuff is happening on the job for you and something happening in your family. and Maybe some things are happening for you physically and things financially and the list goes on and on and on and on and on. And it feels like that moment where mountains are crashing and seas are raging and roaring all at the same time. And you don't know what to do and you just want to go old school like they used to do in the 80s. Calgon, take me away. You want to take a nice hot bubble bath and relax and just get away from the world and close the door and lock the door and just get away from everybody. And you just have your sila moment. And that's what the psalmist is communicating. Like even in all of that, like we dwell in a place with God that is already established in peace, is already established in restoration. And that's where he dwells. The city of the most high God is it's a place of restoration. It's a place of deliverance. It's a place of hope. It's a place of healing. And so out of that, he, he gives this faith confession and, and then he sees this beautiful contrast between what the world is speaking, and what the word has spoken. And then out of that, he begins to walk in confidence. That's the third observation I want you to see. The first observation, again, is the confession of faith that he makes. The second is the contrasting of fearful things versus faithful things. And then the third thing, he begins to walk more upright in the confidence that he has in who his God is. And then he says, the Lord Almighty, the one with all power, the one with all authority, that's the one that's with us. Not a fake God, not a bootleg God, not a dollar general version of God. It is the real, the true and living God, the Lord God, strong and mighty, the Lord who delivered us from the hand of Pharaoh, the one who took us out of bondage in Egypt. He's the one who delivered us and brought us across on dry ground after, dry ground after he parted the Red Sea. It's that God. It's that God who has healed us and made provision for us in the wilderness. It is that God who continues to make a way out of no way. He's still a way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper. He's still light in the darkness. That's who... The psalmist is declaring his God is in the text. So he says, the Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Listen, he says something very interesting there. The God of Jacob is our fortress. You see, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is normally how we hear this phrasing. It's very interesting that he puts it that way and that the, the children in the word of God communicates it, the children of Israel in the word of God communicates it that way because it's the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. It's that same God. So the God of Adria, Abraham was the patriarch of the promise. The God of Isaac is, Isaac is the son of Abraham and who is the son who received the fulfilled promise, if you will, from God. It was passed down from Abraham to Isaac, and then it got to Jacob. Jacob is the son of Isaac, which means he is the grandson of Abraham, and so the grandson also received the promise. Why is this important? 
Why is why am I bringing this out to you? So let me encourage you with this. Listen, the covenant promises of God extend to us, family. So what so what the Lord is showing to you, God keeps his covenant from one generation to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next. And he has always done that from the beginning of time to where we are right now. Listen to what Genesis chapter 17, verse 7, verse 7 says. Excuse me. I'm getting happy, y'all. Genesis 17, verse 7. He says, and I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations. Listen, for an everlasting covenant. To be God to you and to your offspring after you. Do you hear what the Lord is saying? He is keeping his promises, his promises to provide, his promises to protect. And that was that just didn't stop at Jacob. It continues on to generation after generation after generation after generation. And you are living in the generation of the saints today. And God is saying the same covenant promise. The same covenant blessings, the same covenant provisions apply to you. Therefore, we will not fear. Listen, y'all, this is great news. This ain't just good news. This is great news because we have blessings in perpetuity. We get provision and protection continually because that's the way God has promised. Some of y'all uh, uh, work in a profession where you maybe were in sales, maybe in insurance. And if you get this certain insurance package or whatever happens or listen, maybe let me bring it even closer. Songwriters get royalty checks. Uh, uh, because they have blessings or finances in perpetuity because they have written. So anytime you hear a certain song by a certain songwriter, they cashing another check. Well, think of it like that way for us as believers. We are receiving blessings based off the covenant of God in perpetuity. We ain't writing their song. We ain't saying their chord. But God said, because of what I promised Abraham, because of what I promised Jacob, Isaac, because of what I promised to Jacob, you are going to receive the same blessings in its entirety because of what I told them. That's the kind of God I am. And that's why he can say, I am the God of refuge and I am the God of your strength. And I will always be for you a very present help in time of trouble. I love what the scholar Matthew Henry says. He says, they are under the protection of a God in covenant who not is only able to save and help them, but is engaged in honor and faithfulness to help them. Do you hear that? Listen, he says they are under the protection of God in covenant, who not only is able to help them, but listen, he takes delight in it. He is engaged in honor and faithfulness to help them. But if that wasn't good enough for you, let me bring in the scholar himself, Pastor Stephen Furtick, who says he's not just the God of your successes. He's the God of your struggles. He's not just the God of your victories. He's the God of your defeats. He is in all and above all. So if you have had an encounter like Jacob did, where he wrestled with God and the blessing came out of that was he got a new name and a new nature, then trust me, family, if you have an encounter with God right now, he also has the same power to change your circumstances. That's how good and awesome he is. And so what we do right now is we unite in faith as a faith family, as a household of faith, and we declare God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in time of trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Selah. The psalmist puts in another Selah to give us a moment of rest. And so let's go home on this one, family. Let's close the book on this. He says, he gives a faith confession. He paints this picture, contrasting picture of uh, the, the, the actions of the world versus the actions of the word. Uh, and then he uh, gives us uh, this posture to continue to walk in confidence. He takes on the nature of Psalm 3. Lord, you are a shield about me, my glory and the lifter of my head and begins to walk in confidence. And then the fourth observation then he kind of ends this psalm with a call and a command, a call and a command. Verse eight, come and see. There's your call. Come and see what the Lord, listen, has done. The desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes war cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. Verse 10, here's your command. 
He says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. He gives us verse eight. He gives us a call to come and see. And in the verse 10, he gives us a command to be still and know. The psalmist stated, listen, that the Lord Almighty is with us. And one of the ways we make that happen is to invite others to hear the testimony of our God. Listen, y'all, I can't stress this enough. It's time that we start sharing more stories of how God's provision it's, it's, it's been with us, how God's provision has taken care of us in the past, past how his protection is still with us. And, and, and I've learned it this way, that, that it, past grace is an indication of future grace. And his faithfulness back then will sustain us present day right now. His faithfulness back then is still the same faithfulness that we can grab a hold of in present day right now. I love the way the, uh, the, the contemporary saints say, if he did it before... Our God can do it again. He's still Jesus. He's still the same yesterday and today and forevermore. And so how he has provided for us in the past in the area of employment and finances and former seasons of trials of life or crises of life, God is still a provider. If he has restored marriages and families and past challenges back then in the past, he's still the same God who still has the same power to be able to do that now. If he has protecting and healed you before he still has the same power and he still operates out of the same faithfulness to protect and heal you right now he's still the same saving God just like he did the children of Israel bringing them out of Egypt he's still the same one who is saving our souls and delivering us out of bondage today hallelujah to the lamb of God he is Jesus the holy one of Israel and he can do anything but fail Church, we need to start going to our social media platforms. We need to start calling up people. We need to start texting people. We need to start emailing people. We need to tell them about how God, how good our God has been in the past and in the present and forever will be in the future. We need to start decreeing and declaring these testimonies so that others can be encouraged, that others can be strengthened, that others can, can receive the, the abundant life that we have in Christ Jesus, that others can begin to declare as well that God is their refuge refuge and strength and very present help and time of trouble. So I want to put out a challenge. Here's the challenge. It may already be a hashtag that's already out there. God bless it if it is. But let's call this a uh, testimony Tuesday and testimony uh, Thursday. Let's get out here on Tuesday and Thursday and let's just share a testimony of God's faithfulness. How he has been our ever present help in our time of need. Our ever present help in our time of trouble. And let's begin to share some of those stories. We're hearing all these stories of despair and doubt and what appears to be hopelessness. So let's put forth some stories that will communicate love. Love, that'll communicate strength, that'll communicate joy, that'll communicate peace that we can only find in a loving Savior like our Lord Jesus Christ. Because we know that our God, he keeps his promises. That is his character. He's a covenant keeping God. And like I said, if he did it before, he can do it again. And this is the way, one of the ways, not the way, this is one of the ways that we can live out verses eight and nine to come and see the wondrous works of of our God. The last thing is the command out of verse 10. Be still and know that he is God. Family, that's self-explanatory. Just be still. Quiet your soul. Get in, get in a quiet place in your home and begin to do something practical like just inhaling, exhaling, taking 10 deep breaths and just getting still before God and, and let him begin to minister to you as you're taking those deep breaths and as you come to that calm and still place, pick up his word. Maybe, maybe you can get it audibly. Maybe you just play some, 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 some songs that has the gospel written into it, the good news written into it. Uh, maybe you can just begin to read the Psalms and begin to have the Lord minister to you, but begin to get still and know that he is God. Get in this holy word, but get still first. It, it gets so much sweeter. It gets so much better when you still. Uh, I, I love the way my wife uh, does it. You know, whenever uh, we have a meal uh, at home, uh, after she comes home from work, she always say, baby, before we sit down and eat, 
I need to go uh, take a shower. I need to cleanse myself. For some reason, that's a way of allowing her to get still. And as we're sitting down at the table together, as we're sharing a meal together, she's more present. And we begin to know one another better. We get to hear each other's day a little better. We get to be more selfless together. And it's in that moment when you get still like that, when you get in a place of calmness like that, you'll be able, you'll be more apt and have the ability to truly taste and see that the Lord is good. Taste and see that the Lord is good. And most importantly, the psalmist closes officially with what he has already stated in 10 verses before. The Lord Almighty is with us. He repeats this. He restates this. He reemphasizes this. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge, is our fortress. One of the best ways that I have learned to learn is through repetition. And sometimes you just got to keep rehearing or repeating that the Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. So much so the author of Lamentations in chapter three would say this, but I have to call to my mind. I have to call it in. I have to call to, I have to remember. I have to remind myself. I have to rehear. I have to uh, re, re say again. I have to reemphasize to my mind again that the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies are new every day. Great is thy faithfulness. So my soul says the Lord is my portion. So my soul will say God is my refuge and strength and ever present help in my time of trouble. God is our refuge and strength. God is our fortress and he is the Lord almighty. And then he ends again with Selah. Relax. Take another break. Rest in this. Rejoice in this. Be restored in this. So family, as we close out our time together, listen, if you're here online, if you're here online with us, you're watching online with us and you're not a believer, I'm going to ask you this. How are you able to be still? Are you able to grab a hold of verse 11 and truly say that the Lord Almighty is with you? And if you don't have confidence in that, listen, here's all you have to do. All you have to do is what John 1 verse 12 says, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave them the right to become children of God. Listen, all who believed in his name, you have to receive him. You have to receive his free gift of salvation. And he's made that abundantly clear by his selfless act of love for you on Calvary's cross, that he stood in your place, that he paid your sin debt, that he, when he walked the earth, he took on sinful flesh and he, he lived a perfect and obedient life. And then he carried our sin to Calvary's cross and he willingly gave up his life for you and me and for all of mankind. And he shed his precious blood because scripture says that that is what gave us the pardoning of our sins that was brought for us the forgiveness of our sins and then he went into the grave and he went down into the enemy's camp and he defeated the enemy and then he defeated death and then he rose with all power and authority and then he showed himself he showed himself to be our refuge and strength and very present help in our time of trouble and we had a major trouble and that major trouble was we were facing the wrath of God and Jesus came to satisfy the wrath of God by standing in our place and making the provision of the financer and canceling our debt in full. That's good news for you because it's not any works that you can do. And that's what John 1 verse 12 uh, and then verse 13 says. It says, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but they were born of God. Listen, you get a new nature, a new heart, a new language. You get a new address. You're not seated in heavenly places. He's giving you a new mind and a new heart. And listen, you heard me say he has done it. It's not by any works that you can boast. It's freely given. And all you have to do is freely receive. And that's how beautiful and awesome his love for us is. He did everything necessary to save you and set you free from the bondage of sin and death. Will you receive it right now? And all I'm asking you to do is receive it. Listen, right where you are, you can do this. You can just literally bow your head and do like I did. I just said one day, I said, Lord, I surrender. 
And in that moment, I acknowledged, I acknowledged there was a, a fact. I acknowledged that while I was a sinner in need of his grace, it was proven true. I acknowledged that I was a sinner. I was separated from God and he, and I just said, Lord, I surrender. I tried life on my own terms. I was thinking I knew the right way. I was thinking I knew what was best for my life, but Jesus made it abundantly clear that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And I surrendered my will to his will. And that's what I'm asking you to do right now, right wherever you are, right wherever you are. Would you just say, Lord, I surrender. I acknowledge I'm a sinner in need of your saving grace. Lord, have me to be your child, hence now and forevermore. John tells us all who did receive him, he gave them the right. He gave them the permission. He justified them to become children of God. If that's you, do it right now. Right now, wherever you are, I invite you in to the family of faith. I invite you into the, where the Lord dwells, um, where, where the streams of, of, of God may glad the city of God, where he dwells in his most holy place. I invite you to come dwell with him there, dwell with him in this place. It is for you. And if you're a believer, I want to shift to you. If you're a believer and you've been struggling in your faith right now with this, I want to encourage you again, read through this psalm, read through the psalm, read through the psalm, read through the psalm, and be encouraged by the words of life that says, God is your refuge and strength, a very present help in time of trouble. And God, he dwells with you. God helps you and he wants to speak to you because the Lord Almighty is with you and he wants you to know, hey, my covenant protection and provision is with you this day. Will you receive that, my brother and my sister? Will you receive it? And you can receive it right now. Say, Father, forgive me for not trusting that you know what's best for us, that you know what's best for this world, because you are the creator of the heavens and the earth. And God, you know what's best. You know what our medical professional needs. You know what our government needs and those who are in authority making decisions. God, you know what's best. God, forgive me for thinking I know better than you. Father, I'm asking you to help all of us. Whatever camp we're in, God, help us all. Save us all, even if it's from ourselves. Save us all. Save us from, as my old coach used to say, save us from stinking thinking. God, help us to remember that you are good and beside you there is no other Savior. Help us to remember that you give beauty for ashes. For mourning, you give us the oil of joy. For the spirit of heaviness, you give us the garment of praise. God, help us to remember that you're still that God. You're still a covenant-keeping God. And you're to be adored. You're to be, you're, you're, you're to be pursued. You're to be reverenced. You're to be respected, God. God, help us refresh our souls, Lord God creating us clean hearts and renew right spirits with inside of us. Don't take us away from your presence, Holy Spirit. Please don't leave us. God, I thank you, Lord God, for being with us in this moment. God, and I thank you, Lord God, for many, for many this day that are under the sound of my voice hearing that you are good and beside you there is no other Savior. God, I bless you. God, I love you. God, I honor you. It's in your mighty and matchless name I pray. Amen. Hey, family, listen, if that's you, listen, if that's you, if you receive Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior today, if that's you, here's what I want you to do. Listen, we want to stay connected. We want to equip you with some resources. We want to be praying for you. Um, if you're in a local area, we want to connect you, connect you to a local church. Even if it's not rebuilt, we want to make sure that you are placed in loving hands. Last week, we heard from Psalm 23 that we're in good hands because we're in the hands of the good shepherd. We want to make sure that you're in good hands, not just in Christ Jesus, but in a local church that is representing, that's being a true witness for Jesus Christ. And so we want to make sure that you're properly connected. So here's what I want you to do in the comments field. I want you to say, I received Jesus as my refuge and strength today. Uh, we want to get your email. We want to get your name and information. Go to our website, rebuildchurch.com and send us, uh, send us a note. Uh, hit the contact us page and let us know that. Uh, you can go to our social media page. You can go to my social media page and you can let us know uh, that you have received Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior. We want to stay connected with you. We want to pray with you. Rebuild family, I love you. Continue to be generous in your giving. You know how to give. We are had uh, many opportunities to take care of the needs within the community so far. So we're thankful for your faithful giving. I appreciate your generosity, not only of your treasures in this season, listen, but
But some of you have been giving of your time and talents. You've been tithing that. And I thank you for that. And you will be blessed by that. So I thank you. I thank you. I thank you. Listen, I can't wait to connect with you. I can't wait to see you physically. But hey, let's remember to follow the guidelines of those who are in authority over us. Let's continue to practice social distancing. Let's continue to wash our hands. Let's continue to to, uh, be um, uh, patient in tribulation, to be constant in prayer. Let's continue to be practical and socially responsible. And as we close all of our services, family, with this, in Romans chapter 15, verse 13 says, may the God of hope give you joy and peace in your believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. Family, I love you. I miss you. I can't wait to see you. More information to follow this week. Love to see you uh, Monday morning, tomorrow morning on our prayer call at six o'clock. All the information has already been sent out for you to connect. Love for you to pray and intercede on behalf of our community and fellow uh, family members. I thank you. I thank you. I thank you. I can't say enough. I love you. God bless you. Have a wonderful day. And you're now released to spread his love.